Father, thank you for the privilege it is to be with these dear brothers. Thank you as we continue to just avail ourselves to you. We come here today, Lord, with different things going on in our heads and our minds and even in our hearts. And we ask that you would be the one today to speak to us. You would be the one to bring clarity. You would be the one to bring relief or encouragement or hope or guidance or direction. And then, Father, we, we reluctantly ask that you would also be the one to bring any form of conviction to us today that we might need to hear. So we just lay ourselves here before you. Thank you for the person on our left or right. And thank you for just the privilege it is to be here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. Well, as you all know, I like to kind of start out with a review for us. And um, as we say, we've got four. I'll try to make this as quick as possible so we don't spend all our time on review. But it's important for us today to kind of really kind of think back through this whole concept of our past tense position, okay? And the uh, scripture verse, I didn't put it up there, but uh uh-oh, Jerry, I don't know where our screen is up there, but uh, um, so our past tense position just being that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, um, following the course of the world, uh, you know, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And then, you know, we see this dramatic thing that occurs which is in our present tense position, is that God has made us alive together uh, with Christ, okay? And we see that idea of what does it mean to look like that we are made alive together with Christ. And that's going to kind of be what we continue to build upon even here today, okay? We then looked at a passage that talked about how we are called to suffer together. We're called to rejoice together. And most of us want to just take the second part of that and really say, okay, I'm willing to do the rejoicing. Don't particularly care to have to do the suffering part of that, though. But it said that he, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And so that idea of what does it mean for us to experience life in that way, being together, we did then discuss what does our culture have to say about that, and certainly our culture doesn't reinforce that at all. Um, our culture says that when the person that's in need, it's like, well, I have no need of you. You're the weaker parts are dispensable. Uh, and then we talked about how it is that idea of stay away from messy people, okay? And we just kind of have, we know how to walk down through the grand hall have our eyes focused ahead and go, whoops, I'm avoiding that person, okay? Um, But the idea then of just kind of control your emotions as well for you personally. I don't want to be that messy person. Uh, I know I need to uh, just look good on the outside. Then we see this idea here that we are together, okay? We are no longer alone. We've been made alive together with Christ, which is the beauty We are part of a body. I mean, Scripture tells us that over and over again, which means also then we no longer have to be self-reliant. We no longer need to be a fear to be a burden to others that we can actually say, hey, I'm struggling. We then spent with week three this idea of how brothers dwell in unity from Psalm 133. And um, just the the real emphasis on that, that that, uh, what does it mean for us either to dwell together and the idea that when brothers dwell together in unity, it's how good and pleasant it is. Now, just since Saturday night, we've been hearing a lot about, hey, we need to be, have more unity here. Let's tone down the rhetoric, okay? And I just think, wow, okay, so we in the church, I think we've got to take it a whole step further, not toning down the rhetoric, but it's realizing, I need you, and for us to be able to find ways for us to come together, and that's why this whole series has been, guys, we've got to look at life through a different lens, okay? 
I brought up to you this idea, what are the enemies of unity? And, you know, we went through this several times, obviously, but I'm right, you're wrong, needing to agree on everything, inability to listen, my way or the highway, unforgiveness, and then the one we keep camping on here is pettiness. We get down to some of the most simple things that destroy unity that we just go, wow, you know, I don't, I don't want to be connected to that person. Or it's like, you know what, there's just this big issue. It's like, well, wait, what makes it a big issue? It's petty. And then we describe, well, what it makes it petty, okay? So we could spend a ton of time on that, but I just want you all to at least hear that in principle of what I'm trying to communicate with you. Then we looked at how our gifts differ. And just because the gifts that we all have differ can sometimes separate us. When we need all the gifts of the Spirit to be able to do the things that are necessary for us to experience life. Okay, and you'll remember that the gifts that he talked about were serving and teaching, exhorting, thank you Sam, uh, contributing, leading, and acts of mercy. And we're like, gosh, all six of those have great value and benefit, but if we're not careful, we have a tendency to isolate ourselves with the people that have the same gift that we do. Why? Because we have a tendency then to see through the same lens. And it's like, it's just easier that way. We just get along. And all of a sudden, we've got all these separate little colonies out there of believers in Christ who don't want to have anything to do with each other. I'm not even getting into doctrinal differences at that point in time, okay? I'm really speaking about within the body of Christ and how we relate. And then I'm just going to quickly tell this story. And um, I got permission to tell this story. For the first time, uh, my wife Emily and I, this past spring, we helped facilitate divorce care. As you know, I'm divorced, and so, and also divorce care falls underneath my umbrella here at the church. And um, so it's kind of like, we, we need to involve ourselves in this. And I just want to say thank you to Bill Bogart and his wife Brenda and to the Moody's for starting that. And Bill, you need to tell me sometime soon exactly how many years ago that was, whether it was 18, 19, because I know we're coming up on 20 years. But here's the reason I bring this up. The first night we were there, we were sitting in a rectangular table. There was a woman that was sitting on the corner of one of the rectangles, okay? And we were going around the room and each person just kind of sharing a little bit of why they were there. We meet on Wednesday nights. We go around, we're about two thirds of the way around, we come to that woman and she said, I'm here because, and you could tell her voice started to shake, and she said, Sunday night my husband told me he wanted a divorce. So from Sunday night to Wednesday, she did some research and showed up. With that, this woman burst into tears. With that, the woman who had no idea who she was, the woman that was sitting next to her, was a first timer as well, reached out and put her hand on her shoulder. Then the next the person on the seat next to her, but he was on the row going the other direction, he put his hand very appropriately on her. Together, they comforted that woman in an incredibly powerful way. Now here's the thing. That transformed the group. And it created a unity within that group of said, we're all here for each other. Now, they were all there because they've gone through a shared experience. They're all there because they realized this is tough. They might, we might even say they're there out of desperation. But what I want us to realize is 
we have that underpinning desperation as well. We just don't know it. We just don't want to have to deal with it. And I will tell you guys, the reason that I felt it was important to tell you this story, my wife and I typically go to the 930 worship service. This past Sunday, we went to the 11 o'clock, slept in. And we walked into the back of the church. One of the women from divorce care, and this class is rolled up, you know, it's finished, but she was back in the back and she said, oh, did you see the rest of the girls out there? We said, no, we didn't see anybody. And she said, oh, okay. We just said, hey, if, um, you know, if nobody shows, here's where we're going to be sitting. We'd love for you to have come and join us. Gentlemen, seven women from divorce care came and sat on the same row with us this past Sunday. they realize they needed each other. And they have, communi they have created a community of support for each other. And I am sharing that story with you because I don't want us just to think that it has to be something like divorce care or grief share that's also been very powerful this past semester. I want us to realize this is life. It's what I want you to experience at your tables when we wrap up here later, that you realize, hey, we need each other. Let's really be open and honest with our communication as we come here, and let's bless and benefit each other, and let's be blessed and benefit from each other. And so now week five, and we come to a passage of scripture that honestly was gonna be my primary passage. It did not turn out to be that way, but I still wanted to call our attention to this because in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul tells us about himself. And I didn't add the first part of this, but it starts out with him in the visions that he had seen. And so they were so powerful that any person could have become arrogant. You know, it's a little bit like, oh yeah, I know so-and-so, you know, but he's like, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. All right. I hope all of us have had times where it's like, oh, Lord, if this could ever pass, please, you know, we want to get rid of something that causes us to be uncomfortable or whatever. Nobody knows what the thorn in his flesh was. There's speculation, but that's all it is. And so then we see what came from that. And when he pleaded, this is what the Lord said back to him. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And it's kind of like, well, wait, I... I I don't think power is made perfect in weakness. Power is made perfect when we continue to improve, when we continue to gain more control, and when we are able to see things so clearly, and we know, and we're right, and we're this. It's like power is made perfect. Where in weakness? Now, you know, I'm going to be silly when I say this. This is not Pat Hoban standing up here and saying this to you. This is what... The Lord God Almighty said to the Apostle Paul, and he recorded it in his letter to the Corinthians, which we say is the Word of God. My power is made perfect in weakness. We have an internal struggle with that, gentlemen. And so he goes on to say, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Why? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Gentlemen, do you all see that we don't even boast about it gladly. We don't even reveal our weaknesses. We do our best to cover them up. Why? Because we want to so that not the power of Christ may rest upon us, that we're in control 
Remember how I said, we don't want to be that messy person. We don't want our emotions to be out of control. We want to be in control because we need to present an image. And he's saying, I boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. And then for the sake of Christ then, and here's a word that I think we've got to find really kind of shocking to us. I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Now I'm going to call our attention to what I've put in red there in verse 10. I am content. Rarely do I find people who are content. What I find primarily is people who are complacent or people who are struggling to find that level of contentment and they're looking in places that is not going to ever deliver. That's why early on we looked at the, the song Lukenbach, you know, and he goes, that, that idea of four car garage and we're still building on. This coat and tie is choking me, that high society, all that, you know, and we, we, we fall prey to that because the culture screams it to us. And so then he finishes this passage, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. And I just want us to be challenged deeply with that. But where the Lord really took me to emphasize this even more for us was focusing on the word humility that we have kind of talked about here throughout. And humility, if we look at the Greek word there, and I'm not even going to bother to try to pronounce that for you, says having a humble opinion of oneself, a deep sense of one's moral littleness, modesty, humility, lowliness of mind. And that idea that says, hey, you know, I want to be able to see myself in the right light. I want to have a deep sense of just where I fit in and how my, my world is, is important, but it's small, and I'm here in connection. Webster's defines it as the freedom from pride or arrogance. Okay? Humility says, this is who I am. Pride says, this is who I am. Arrogance says, look at you. And then I came up with this, and it's Pat's definition of humility. And I really would like to ask you all to think this through, if you would, just on your own heart basis of how easy or how difficult this is for you. I can say I'm sorry. Now you have to realize I'm talking about with the right spirit and the right attitude. Not I'm sorry. Okay. But to have the sincerity of heart, I'm sorry. Meaning, can you be wrong, gentlemen? Can you truly say I'm sorry and ask for forgiveness and realize the impact that you've had on somebody? But just the same, I want to say, can you say thank you? Are you able to be able, able to say, well, thank you, knowing that that was helpful, that meant something to me. I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful for what you did for me. And then the one that I find so common here, I seek first to understand, not to be understood. So many conversations, if you think about it, you will find yourself where it's kind of like, I've got to be understood, and I'm going to make my point to you. Why? Because if you understand me, then you will agree with me. And humility says, I want to hear your point. I want to understand. Help me to hear what you're trying to communicate to me. Now, for those of you in the room today who are married, I'm going to ask you, take this home tonight and put it on, wear it, deliver it, 
in your communication, be able to say, I want to understand. There will be an opportunity then to be able to say, can I share with you where I'm coming from on this? I can ask for help. I can raise my hand. I can say, hey, I need you. And then lastly, the question is, with humility, I'm safe. And what do we mean by safe? Safe meaning that I can share myself, that you're not going to run from me. Safe meaning that, you know, you're willing to share with me as well. Now, I was trying to think about this, and I could only pull up Acts 13 for this, but the definition of humility that I saw as we looked at it, maybe from an Old Testament perspective, would be this. Um, Referring to David, I found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. The beauty of Acts chapter 13 here in this verse and what he says, a man after my heart. Gentlemen, I hope that we can realize that that means I have something I'm after instead of my best, which means we're stepping down from being the one who has to be in control. A man after God's heart. I desire to please you, Father, not to please myself. But I know that in pleasing you, it will bring great joy and delight to me. But I know that in my efforts to please myself, it will always fall short. And the beauty of just saying, King David had that. Now, Woo. King David ran off the cliff a few times too, didn't he? But God said he was a man after my heart. So now I want to take a look and let's get to our scriptures that's on your handout there. Let's see what Paul and Peter had to say about humility. Paul starts out in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. All right, so he's encouraging them. He says, I'm urging you to do this. This is what, if you were called as part of the body of Christ, this is what's required. And the first characteristic he brings out there, gentlemen, is with all humility. With all humility. And so we're trying to realize, wow, what is humility? Well, it's exactly what we just ran through. And we want to be able to go, okay, I I need to carry out my calling with all humility. He goes on, as he says, with gentleness, excuse me, and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And then look at this, eager to maintain what? The unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Guys, this is why I I keep saying, my way or the highway, that doesn't create a unity of the Spirit. Needing to be understood doesn't create a unity of Spirit. There are so many things we've already talked about that we have to realize creates division, not unity. But when we walk in humility, when we walk in the ways that he's describing here, then we can be committed to the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Philippians 2 goes for us in an even, I think, a deeper way. But he says, so So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, being of the same mind. Okay, here we are. We need to all be of the same mind. Having the same love, which is the love of God the Father, and then he says to love one another. Being in full accord and of what? One mind. Wouldn't that be great? He tells them then, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Fellas, I, again, I cannot point the finger at you without realizing, you know, it's it's me too. I'm not standing here having mastered this. 
But I realize, he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Do you realize how much it is that sometimes our underlying motivation truly is selfish ambition? We get it twisted. We want it for us. This is what I've determined is needed. He says, but what? In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. That's a characteristic of what humility is, to count others more important. I value you, so therefore I want to hear you. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Thanks be to God, he does give us the privilege of looking for our own interest. But he says, not just only, but for the interest of others as well. He goes on in Philippians 2. Have this mind which is among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and listen to this, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That is perhaps, gentlemen, the most profound definition of humility. To leave the presence of God to come to this world, to live amongst us, to be the sacrificial lamb, to give his life, even on the cross, which identified him as an absolute criminal. He humbled himself to that point. And what did God do? Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name, why? So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse 10 and verse 11 is what Christ received because he humbled himself, what he did for us, the gift that he gave us, that brought us back into a right relationship with God the Father. Now, gentlemen, I will say this probably later in our, my talk here, but I want us to be able to realize, when I said to you earlier that humility allows you to say thank you, I'm wondering if reading this passage gives you any sense of the need to say Thank you. And we realize that humility is something that starts here between us and God the Father because we realize I was in desperate need. If we thought that woman at divorce care that night was in desperate need, holy cow! When we stand before God the Father and we realize I'm in desperate need, and we read here what Christ has done, humility allows us to say, thank you. Colossians 3 also adds this for us. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Look at these compassionate hearts. That means I'm thinking about others. Kindness. That means I'm relating with others. And then humility, meekness, and patience. He's giving us characteristics and qualities that are all part of how we are to relate together. Do you realize, I could spend too much time here talking about what all the opposites are of these, of what our culture has to say. But look at verse 13. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Now you remember I said that our culture, one of the things that prevents unity is unforgiveness. And here we are called to forgive each other. How? 
as the Lord God has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And so we are reminded again, wow, I have been forgiven. Thank you, Father. How can I not forgive you? And above all, put these on love, which binds everything, there's our word, together in perfect harmony. And here's the beauty. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed were called in one body, and be thankful. First Peter 5 says this, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to your elders. Let's just stop right there, shall we? I love this table over here with you guys and with the gray hair. JB, I'm sorry, but, but uh, you know, I need you all to be subject to me. I'm, I'm older than you. But no, he doesn't stop there. He says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Wow. That's a relational principle that I think we need to really take into consideration of how to relate all of us with humility toward one another. Why? For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So here's kind of as we begin to land. Humility. I ask the question, how? How do we get it? How do we have it? How do we hold on to it? And then here's my simple thing, guys. I hope it's not overly simplistic. By remembering our present tense condition. What is that? But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. That was our past tense position. Present tense, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. How? In Christ Jesus. Not because you had some other relational contacts, not because you had the, you know, the capital to buy your way into it, but because of what Christ Jesus did. Gentlemen, that is the essence when we understand that, that brings forth a spirit of humility within us that says, that was the only way. I don't deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. It's what we carry forth. It's the gospel, obviously. And it's why we want to see that the important element of the gospel creates within us a beautiful spirit of humility. Colossians 3 goes on to say this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. How? With thankfulness in your hearts to God. I don't want to underscore this too much, but there's our word again, thankfulness, thanking in our hearts towards God. That we would carry forth something that continually reminds us, wow, thank you, Lord. That then causes us to be reconnected to that spirit of humility that says, then I want to carry that out relationally. And that's why I've given you over and over and over the graphic of hands held high. And that's the abiding, as we've talked about. Then it also bleeds out horizontally. And we're together here first, and now we're together here. We experience humility here because we have nothing else to receive that he hasn't already given us, even though we don't deserve it. And then we have humility in our relationships with others. 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And here we go again, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And I could only come up with one word after that. 
Amen. Now, I do want to do two things here, if you all will bear with me. I want to give you a little bit of a homework assignment. And you're going to need to look at your handout here. But your handout allows for many things, and I know the print up there may be a little small, but I want you to reread each passage of Scripture and meditate on it this week. And then what I'd like you to do is write down the things from each passage we are, that, excuse me, that we are and we are to do as a result of our present condition. Not for self-righteousness, but out of an understanding of where it all comes from. Then carry your list with you as a reminder and be more self-aware, not self-reliant, more self-aware as you deal with others. See where the things listed on your paper were evident as you dealt with others and give thanks. See where the things on your list were missed and humbly ask for forgiveness and humbly ask for, for help and then ask yourself the question, am I safe? Next week, our brother Tom Marion is going to be speaking. He's going to be talking about moving from isolation to community. He'll be using Proverbs 18.1, Romans 15.5 through 7. Now, here are your discussion questions. <clears throat> the gentlemen, I've stood before you five weeks here, and I uh, woke up in the middle of the night last night and felt compelled to look at a passage of Scripture again. And I want to show this to you, and this is going to sound very potentially arrogant on my part. I hope you can hear it in the spirit of humility that I want to share it with you. Here's a final thought. This is what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth. And I'd like to be able to share it with you in that same spirit. It says, have you been thinking all along that we've been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we've been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. And that's what I'd like to believe. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish and that you may find me not as I wish. That perhaps, listen to this, guys, there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. And it's almost like if I come back here next summer and all I find is those words. And he says, I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you and I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented. And look at this, of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. This is a perfect setup for what Tom is going to be talking to us next week about. And I need you all to hear this, brothers. We need to take to heart what we've been talking about for the first five weeks and realize that Tom's getting ready to come and put an exclamation point on it for us. And I know that as we move into the summer, travel schedules get in the way and all those kind of things, but I'm going to ask you to make a special effort to be here next Tuesday morning. Lord, help us as we just continue to meditate upon these things. I pray, Father, that you would speak mightily to us around our tables and even as we leave and even as we fulfill our homework assignment. I thank you, Father, for each of my brothers here today. And I pray, Father, that our ears would continue to be open to what you have to say to us and for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, God.